This little park across from the Scarsdale Railroad Station is a favorite spot for bikers and visitors entering the parks along the Bronx River. This pretty waterfall was once the location of the Crawford's Mill that used the water power of the Bronx River to grind grain and saw lumber in the mid-1700s. Mills like these were the basis of towns throughout North America. The Bronx River has been central to Scarsdale and all the communities it flows by in Westchester and the Bronx. It was also essential to Native Americans who lived in the Bronx River Valley for centuries. But these waters were not always so picturesque. In the 1890s, the river was foul with industrial pollution and human waste. In the 1970s, the river was so buried by garbage in the South Bronx that people didn't even know it existed. The history of this river is also the unique story of how people in Westchester and the Bronx rallied to save the river, and in doing this, they also helped to revive their own communities. The original source of the Bronx River lies under the Kensico Dam Reservoir in northern Westchester. The construction of the dam diverted the river's headwaters, and today it flows from Valhalla for 16 miles through cities, villages, and towns in Westchester. Crossing into the Bronx for another eight miles, the river squeezes through the narrow gorge, the New York Botanical Garden, travels through the southern Bronx, then widens, becomes tidal, and empties into the East River, and finally the ocean. The Wikisqueak people call the river Aquahung, meaning fast stream flowing along a high bluff. This tribe was part of the Wappinger Confederation of eight tribes who resided along the banks of the Hudson and Bronx River Valleys. In 1609, when Henry Hudson sailed up the Hudson River, he saw people at the large fishing village near the mouth of the Nepperham River in Yonkers. He encountered villages all along the Hudson and its tributaries. The Bronx River served as the boundary line for the hunting grounds between the Weekasqueak and Siwanoi tribes. The river would also form the boundaries for manors, towns, and cities defined by the Dutch and the English in the 17th century and after the American Revolution. The Dutch Republic was quick to take advantage of Hudson's findings, and they established fur trading posts throughout the colony named New Netherlands. They claimed lands that stretched from the Connecticut to the Delaware River and along the Hudson River to Albany. At the tip of Manhattan, the Dutch West India Company founded New Amsterdam. Nicholas van Wassenaer published the observations of the first fur traders. Tis worthy of remark that with so many tribes, there is so great a diversity of language. They vary frequently, not over five or six leagues, forthwith comes another language. They live in summer mostly on fish. The men repair to the river and catch a great quantity in a short time, as it is full and furnishes various sorts. The country is full of game, hogs, bears, beavers, wolves, pigeons fly wild, they are chased by the foxes like fowls. The most wonderful are the dreadful frogs, in size about a span, which croak with a ringing noise in the evening. The most valued pelts of all would come from these ingenious creatures. The beaver's skillful ability to build dams formed lakes throughout the Bronx River Valley that nourished other creatures and plants. The Native Americans call the Bronx River Valley Lapa Walking, meaning the place of the stringing lakes. The beaver is the main foundation and means through which this beautiful land was first occupied by people from Europe. Colonization in North America coincided with the demand for beaver felt hats. These hats were worn in Europe from the 1500s to the mid-1800s. 
As the beaver trade declined, silk hats, like the one worn by President Abraham Lincoln, gained in popularity. Now the quality of the beaver's fur was what made it so important for making felts. You could press it, process it, and it made a very good durable felt. But it was also quite water repellent. We could just take the beaver and put it over ourselves like that, and you have skunk some time on one side, different things like that. Um, another cool thing was, if you had a pelt, right, you would take the pelt, and if you know, your wife of your community, the woman that's working in the garden, pulling corn and things of that nature, she would make a bag out of the pelt, you know? She wouldn't make a hat and pull all the fur off. She would make something like this. I have an otter, right? So an otter is called a Niki Squawk in Algonquin. And the beaver is called a Tumunk. Tumunk means he who cuts wood. Until the Europeans showed up, the beaver was not a commercial commodity. Right. They used the teeth new, for making tools. But they also ate the, the beaver animals, too, particularly the beaver tail, which I understand is a very tasty uh, delicacy. But the Native Americans would only hunt the beaver with a very great deal of respect. And they had to be handled in a certain way. The bones and remains had to be very respectfully gathered up and then returned to the water from whence the beaver was taken. The beaver and other fur animals would be hunted to near extinction by the late 1700s. This would be the first of many man-made changes that dramatically changed the ecology of the Bronx River and the traditions of the Native Americans. Few Europeans dared to venture into the wilderness of the Bronx River Valley in the 1600s. But Jonas Bronk and his wife Antonia traveled from Holland with their servants and bought 500 acres of land from local chiefs in 1638. Now Jonas Bronk is a very, very interesting character in the history of the Bronx River. And he was an ex-sea captain. He was about maybe 38, 39 years old, uh, which was a pretty, pretty ripe middle age, you know, back in the 17th century. His plantation was entirely devoted to growing tobacco. He was only there for about four years. And he died apparently of natural causes in 1643, just as a major war between the Native Americans and the Dutch was erupting. But just in that short amount of time was enough to put his name on the map and eventually give the name to the Bronx River and then ultimately the, uh, the borough and the county. Jonas Bronk had maintained good relations with his tribal neighbors. In 1642, Weekesqueak leaders met in Bronk's home with Dutch director William Keift to sign a peace agreement that did not last. A series of attacks on both sides led to a two-year war known as Keift's War. It further devastated native tribes and deteriorated Dutch rule in the colony. Director Keeft hired mercenary Captain John Underhill, who committed some of the nation's worst atrocities against Native Americans. This woodcut from Underhill's account of the Pequot War in 1637 illustrates how his troops surrounded and killed over 700 men, women, and children in Mystic, Connecticut. During Keeft's war, Underhill's men massacred over 600 villagers in Pound Ridge. The Dutch West India Company recalled Keift for his crimes, and he died in a shipwreck on his way back to Holland. Peter Stuyvesant, also known as Peg Leg Peter, was the last Dutch governor. New Amsterdam would surrender with little resistance to the English in 1664. English rule brought more settlers to the Bronx River Valley. A census conducted in 1698 counted 917 whites and 146 blacks in Westchester County, which included all of the Bronx. Of that number, only a few hundred lived in the Bronx River Valley. Native Americans would bargain land for survival and be further driven from their tribal homes. By 1790, there would be 3,000 settlers in the valley. The main communities were White Plains, East Chester, the town of Westchester and West Farms. When the Europeans came, they took the land and changed the concept of land usage. The Native Americans, their land was not owned by them, it was used by them. Something that people use together. Bronx River is possessive. It's something owned by a person. And it may help explain a little bit why Europeans who can use what they own any, any way they want to were so careless as to uh, pollute the river the way they did. 
Bronx Falls in West Farms is where the first mills were known to be established on the Bronx River in the 1670s. The Bronx River geologically does a fairly rapid fall in height, beginning about where the Botanical Gardens is today and ending in West Farms. More than enough to create opportunities to create mill dams. The initial mills that were built by the English settlers in West Farms did disrupt migratory fish such as the alewife herrings, but it didn't particularly pollute the river. It was mainly for grinding grain and uh, sawing lumber. The Delanceys owned the Richardson Mill Dam during the American Revolution. Like many wealthy landowners, they used slaves and freemen to operate their mills. The river could be dangerous, and it took the life of Peter Delancey's son. A second son of Peter, Colonel James Delancey, was a feared pro-British supporter. He led raids throughout Westchester to supply English troops. James escaped the firing squad, but the Delancey's mill was confiscated and sold to the Liddig family after the war. In the nearby New York Botanical Garden is one of the last standing mill buildings on the Bronx River. Its original name was the Lower Large Snuff Mill, and uh, what they made there was something that was very popular in the 18th century, which was dry powdered tobacco. And there, there's no nice way of putting this, you snorted it up your nose. But the, the Lorillards came up with some innovations, producing snuff in mass quantities using mill wheel technology, the same technology used to grind corn or wheat, they could apply it to tobacco. And then the second innovation was grinding up dried rose petals. They would harvest the rose petals and add them to the snuff. And they grew their own roses, which roughly is on the site of the, the Rockefeller Rose Garden in today's botanical gardens. After moving from the Bronx in 1870, the Lorillards built a billion dollar tobacco company. Their marketing campaign for Newport cigarettes in the 1960s made headlines. During the long, harsh winters, the river gave us another industry. Before the days of refrigeration, ice was harvested from the mill ponds. It was cut into large blocks and delivered to grocers and homes where they were used in ice boxes to keep food from spoiling. An average home delivery was a 50 pound block. You have at least 12 mills on the river. Some of them do things other than organic materials. There's chemicals from gunpowder, from bleaching, a paint factory that had chemicals that were certainly dumped into the river. Shortly after the year 1812, you had a uh, major paint factory go up in West Farms. Had its own uh, brand of uh, color of red. It was known as Bronx River Red. But uh, of course, paint factory, what's the main ingredient in paint in those days was lead. And this, they were buying lead in quantities about 30,000 pounds at a time. The river flows through the Bronx Zoo. Through the animal enclosures, a cascading dam can be seen that was used by one of New York's earliest textile mills. The Balton Bleach Factory's mill pond is now part of the zoo's Mitsubishi Riverwalk, which is also a sanctuary for migrating birds and other wildlife. These waters are clear now, but they were once badly contaminated by the chemicals used for bleaching and processing cotton cloth. Further north in the suburb of Scarsdale is an historic park where Ernest Hobald built the Bronx River Gunpowder Factory. The stone foundation of the wooden mill is all that remains of this once extensive factory. The mill supplied gunpowder for the United States government during the Mexican War in 1846 and dynamite for building the New York and Harlem Railroad about the same time. Making gunpowder was an extremely dangerous process. Any number of things could go wrong. Particles in the air and on the surface could easily ignite. The graves of three victims were buried in a cemetery in Hartsdale. In the nearby village of Tuckahoe is one of two standing mill buildings on the Bronx River. The old stone mill, now a restaurant, was a cotton mill for cloth weaving. Later, it produced rubber garments for soldiers during the Civil War. The mill once provided employment and second jobs for the families who worked in the marble quarries. High quality marble was discovered in Tuckahoe along the river in the 1820s. 
quarries were mined in Tuckahoe, Bronxville, and Eastchester, and it became a boom industry. Marble was in great demand for its exceptional quality and a choice for neoclassical buildings that were popular in the 19th century. It was used in many landmark buildings throughout New York and the country. Blocks of Tuckahoe marble would be skillfully cut into shapes. Some of these blocks would weigh as much as 33 tons. Before trains were common, the marble was driven to the East River barges by teams of horses or oxen along the Post Road, which was once a Native American trail. Alexander Masterton owned one of the most successful quarries, and although the quarries were all shut by the 1930s, the house he built in Bronxville is still standing. South of Tuckahoe is Bronxville Lake. Here, the river powered Lancaster Underhill Sawmill during the American Revolution. His mill pond was said to have been formed by beavers living at the foot of his garden. We know that in 1825, the Bronx River was still considered pure enough to drink. An engineer employed by the New York Water Works Company estimated that 9,000 gallons could be delivered daily from Underhill's Crossing to a thirsty New York City. The Bronx River was never tapped, and the city created reservoirs in Croton and at Kensico Dam in northern Westchester instead. In 1915, a massive stone dam of remarkable engineering replaced the earthen dam that had been built in 1884. The historic mill town of Kensico, named for a Siwanoi Indian chief, Kokensico, would be dismantled, burned, and flooded, and the upper reaches of the Bronx River were diverted into the reservoir. This change resulted in cutting the volume of the river by 25% and making it even harder for the river to tolerate the damages of pollution. Beginning in the mid-1800s, thousands of immigrants would pass through Ellis Island and some would settle and work along the river. The Harlem and New York Railroad connected New York City to White Plains in 1844 and hastened the growth of towns and industries on the river. The population of Westchester doubled between 1850 and 1870 and again in 1890 and 1910. Lack of regulation and inadequate sewers allowed waste and toxins from farms, privies, and industries to pour directly into the river. Everyone agreed something had to be done. The first conservation efforts had its roots in the construction of the New York Botanical Garden and the Bronx Zoological Society. They were part of the Bronx Park, one of six immense parks built in the Bronx after New York City annexed the Bronx from Westchester in the late 1800s. People saw the development that was going to be happening in the Bronx and knew that we needed to set aside some of the most aesthetically pleasing and kind of ecologically significant portions of open space for future generations. So it was really, we're kind of standing on the, on the shoulders of giants in a lot of ways with some of the thinking and planning and development and preservation that went on in the even 19th century. Movements to create public parks were being initiated across the country. Bronx Park was very popular and the lakes created from the river were a central attraction. But the smells emanating from the river started to keep people away, and in 1905, contamination was killing large numbers of waterfowls. William H. Niles was a founding member of the zoo. In a published article, he wrote, Nature made it beautiful, and if the despoiling hand of man could only be restrained, it would continue to be beautiful to the end of time. Niles made it his mission to restore the river and wrote the bill that would initiate the creation of the Bronx River Parkway and Reservation. The 1906 Act allowed for a commission to study the feasibility of preserving the river by creating a reservation of lands along its banks from Kensico Dam to Bronx Park. And in their 1906 illustrated report, they urged the need to create the reservation and restore the river. They wrote, Insufficient current to carry off the sewage and refuse discharged into the stream is rapidly becoming an open sewer. The low meadow and marshlands always wet, and at seasons overflowed are not suited to habitation. In the city portions and in some of the towns above, there is a low class of development and increasingly unsanitary conditions. 
The reports of the commissioners reflected both their dedication to improving the river and the interests of the upper classes. Madison Grant was the most controversial member of the commission. He reflected the extremes of the progressive era. He was known for saving the California redwoods and many endangered species. However, he was also a leader of the popular eugenics movement, which believed that a so-called Nordic race was superior. He also pushed to pass laws restricting immigration in the 1920s. The commission was headquartered in James Cannon's offices in Scarsdale. Cannon was a banker and president of Scarsdale Estates and the Heathcote Association. He was the only commissioner who did not live to see the project completed. Six years would pass before the budget was approved. The parkway would be plagued by delays caused by New York City politicians and during World War I. However, the commissioners maintained rare political autonomy over a 25-year period, achieving historic results. Homes, dwellings, factories, and in some cases, whole communities were removed. Miles of billboards were taken down. A buffer zone of 300 to 1,000 feet would be cleared to protect the river from sewage and create the parkland. Two-thirds of the land was purchased or donated. Emily Butler donated 25 acres of her Fox Meadow estate in Scarsdale to create Butler Woods. The commission kept up a successful publicity campaign. To gain support, they gave the impression that they were mostly clearing so-called shanty towns and low-class developments for the public good. However, substantial homes, working-class communities, and businesses were also cleared. South of Westchester, though, once you got into the Bronx, uh, a lot of the good feelings didn't quite carry on. They used a lot of eminent domain. In the day, it was called condemnation proceedings. You know, we're taking over this land, you're out of here, you got one of two things you can do. You could tear down your house, or if you can afford it and you find a spot to put it, you could lift up your house and move it literally off the reservation. A number of communities that were broken up in this fashion. Uh, around uh, Rosedale, at uh, about at the foot of Burke Avenue in the Bronx today, in Wakefield, around uh, Gun Hill Road thereabouts, or whole communities that just had to be lifted and uh, shoved aside to make room for this reservation. The length of the river was dredged not once but four times, and a history of clutter and trash was removed. Owners and factories were encouraged to connect to the Bronx Valley Trunk Sewer, which was being constructed at the same time. 30,000 trees and 146,000 shrubs were planted, 57,000 trees were trimmed, and 17,000 disease trees were removed. Leading landscape designers and engineers were brought in. They were inspired by the naturalistic approach of Calvert Vaux and Frederick Law Olmsted, who had designed Central Park. As far back as 1884, Olmsted and park advocates had envisioned a green belt of connected parks to span the entire length of the river. A high level of craftsmanship accompanied every detail of the parkway. Bridges were beautifully designed and had to harmonize with nature as much as possible. The parkway was designed to be a leisure ride rather than the commuter route it became. The road curved with the landscape and even a few bumps were added to make the ride more fun. By the mid-1920s, people were strolling the parks and 16 bathing facilities were set up to control crowds and make sure they wore bathing suits. The Bronxville Review newspaper wrote, But a few minute walk to the Bronx and a dip in the somewhat shallow but glorious little river help them to forget that the thermometer is hovering above the 100 mark. In a democracy such as ours, the ideal is the good of the greatest number. If the parkway can be the poor man's playground in furnishing him with bathing pools, children's playgrounds, and the rich man's playground, and furnishing him with one of the most beautiful auto drives in the country, it will have met a real need in a truly American way. Real estate values, tax revenues, and suburban development rocketed after the parkway was built. In 1910, the land around the parkway was valued at 22 million. By 1932, it had risen to 281 million. At the Parkway opening ceremony, William Niles commented, When I first conceived of the idea of the Bronx River, it was not with the thought of building a parkway, 
but the purpose of protecting a beautiful little stream running through the valley from destruction. The resulting improvement has been almost unbelievable. A high class of residence buildings immediately commenced and has continued without intermission. The river in Westchester and the northern Bronx was greatly improved, but contamination and flooding still needed to be addressed. Westchester fought to retain the beauty of the parkway lands when the parkway was modernized. South of Westchester, the urban sections of the river would decline rapidly. Uh, City Hall was never terribly enthusiastic about the Bronx River Parkway project, uh, partly because it was a state commission and Tammany Hall couldn't get its uh, thumbs into the project in any way, so there was a thundering lack of interest uh, expressed City Hall through several mayoral administrations. So the upshot was that the, the reservation in Westchester County never quite was linked up with the reservation in the Bronx. But then we moved into a period of forgetting, right? So the mid 20th century was a time of, you know, rapid development, suburbanization, development of the highway system. So they took the Bronx River Parkway in southern Westchester County and the Bronx, Robert Moses did, and straightened it and expanded it and made it into kind of the modern highway that we have here in the Bronx. And in that process really kind of pushed the river aside. So by the 1970s, the river in the Bronx was really just a mess. Uh, it was an eyesore, it was a place the parents told their kids, don't ever go near that thing. During the 1970s, New York City was on the verge of bankruptcy and arson-plagued neighborhoods in the South Bronx epitomized the decline. The southern sections of the Bronx River suffered from neglect and became a dumping ground for garbage and toxins. These problems would also motivate activists and concerned citizens to restore their communities and the river. Anthony Bowser was an outspoken police commander in the Bronx who helped initiate one of the first river cleanups in the 1970s. He was a Westchester resident. And every day he would drive down the Bronx River Parkway to go to his place of work down in the South Bronx. And he was really appalled by the contrast between the state of the river in Westchester County, where it was still largely, you know, preserved with the Red Bronx River Parkway Reservation, he would travel south and would just see it deteriorate remarkably. And so he teamed up with Ruth Anderberg, but then Ruth really took it on and formed the Bronx River Restoration Group Ruth Anderberg and her team started by removing garbage in one of the worst sections of the river. The place where industry began had become one of the poorest neighborhoods in New York, West Farms. So the Bronx River Restoration was very active in the 70s and the 80s, and they also got a generation of young people out on the river. Um, this was largely through the Summer Youth Employment Program in New York City. So they were able to pay young people to go out, you know, clear out uh, invasive species, clear out trash and debris from the river, a lot of um, unearthing and digging out some of the historic pathways along the river that had been silted over over time. I really didn't believe it was possible. Um, we were actually putting pavers down and making walkways. And all of a sudden the possibility and the probability of it lights up in front of me. It's fantastic to see that such things can actually happen. In 1980, the Bronx River Restoration Group published a master plan for creating a greenway of connecting parks and improving the full length of the river. This vision would be adopted by its successor organizations, the Bronx River Working Group in the 1990s and the Bronx River Alliance formed in 2001. Years of hard work by river advocates opened the eyes of politicians and the public. And by like 2000, there were 60 different groups that were members of the working group. So many people, in fact, that they had to split into teams. It was really a ripe moment for it to happen because in the 1990s, this is when the environmental justice movement was getting going. Low-income communities, communities of color were asking questions about why is it always that the worst air quality, the worst water quality are in communities of color, particularly in the South Bronx for a, a new generation of community leaders who were mostly working at nonprofits doing a variety of different work really. But what they all saw in common was, hey, we have this river that flows through the middle of this borough and it's something that all of us have a stake in. So there's a lot of, I think, Bronx pride in this, but also a lot of sense of 
environmental justice. In 1997, the National Guard was brought in by Governor Pataki to lift automobiles out of the river. Community activist Majora Carter and her group successfully transformed an illegal dumping ground into Hunts Point Riverside Park. It was one of the early achievements in a string of parks and waterfront restoration projects that are making the Bronx River Greenway a reality. Our total weight picked up today was 1,121 pounds and uh, point five. That's awesome, over a thousand pounds of drag. In 2009, an abandoned concrete factory was turned into Concrete Plant Park. The Youth Ministry for Peace and Justice, a group dedicated to restoring South Bronx neighborhoods, organized the effort. So they had rallies, rallies that were like, replant the cement plant, got people mobilized, and the city agreed. So decided instead of that being a truck route, they would make it into a park. Vision that you see here, from down to the tables, to the reading circles, were visions that the community had. We saw a vision that this place could be a park, that community folks needed access to the river. Um, and then we began to bring the politicians in, we began to hold some press conferences, media events. We live here, we want this space uh, back, we want a place for our kids and our families to enjoy. What this proves is that uh, people in communities have the inherent vision for what works best for their communities. In 2015, a fish ladder was installed at River Park, the site of the old Delancey Dam. That dam, really all of the dams, they're beautiful and people love them because of the waterfalls they create, but they're actually ecological disasters. But what happened over time was really the dams that were built up and down all of our eastern rivers have blocked off these fish from being able to access the freshwater sections of the river that they need to spawn. All right, There's a big effort over, uh, underway along many rivers up and down the eastern seaboard to help bring back alewife herring. It used to be so dramatic, people would talk about the rivers running silver in the spring. They were just full of these fish. And it was such an abundant source of food. Oysters were another one of those species, I would say, along with alewife herring and beaver that were just foundational for both the Native Americans and, again, the European settlers who came in. And slowly over time, just that over-harvesting diminished the actual habitat structure that the oysters needed to survive. And then, of course, uh, pollution as well was devastating to the oyster populations, and then, and then in turn devastating to the humans who ate the oysters. There's been a big interest in bringing back oysters to New York Harbor, um, led by the Harbor School and by New York, New Jersey Baykeeper. And they've been um, bringing back reefs, actually grown at the Harbor School on Governor's Island by high school students. We are very proud to say that the Bronx River um, site has been the most successful. These are not oysters that anyone should eat because the water quality um, is not good enough. Now, of course, with climate change, there's a renewed interest in looking at, well, what are the ways we can protect ourselves and our waterfront communities from the impact of storm surge? Things like bringing back oyster reefs and salt marshes as protective buffers can help blunt the impact of storm surge and dissipate that wave energy before it hits the shore. In Westchester, since the 1970s, the Parks Department has closed the Bronx River Parkway to traffic for bicycle Sundays and created bike paths along the river. The Bronx River Parkway Reservation Conservancy is a nonprofit group that has worked since the 1990s to preserve the historic legacy and ecology of the parkway. So the reservation is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It has significance nationally. This is a composition. It was a composition of roadway, parkland, and river, and we want it to remain that way. We became very aware of a proliferation of invasive vines on the trees and, you know, just subsuming the park. 
and together with the Westchester County Parks Department, we formed um, vinecutter.com. Yeah, mostly winged euonymus, the so-called burning bush. So restoration is what we're all about today, where we're not only removing invasives, but we're planting natives. We've got a great group of volunteers here. We've got Boy Scouts, we've got Girl Scouts, we've got retired folks like me, we have parents, a real motley crew, as they would say. And in fact, now there are a bunch of vine cutting groups in the county that will get together and do a swarm. It's exactly what it sounds like. All the vine cutters get together and they really attack an area. You know, we've actually had a lot of success in freeing large areas of the parkway, but there will always be more to do. I'm Justine McClellan, a teacher at Bronxville High School. And I started a Bronx River research program and I thought, what a great opportunity to get students involved in the environment and doing some authentic research using what we have locally. The students actually helped me write a grant with the Bronxville School Foundation to obtain the same equipment that Columbia University uses to study the Hudson River. Even though these students have grown up in Bronxville within walking distance of the river, they're often surprised to find fish and turtles. That experience inspires them to care about it and to want to be involved, to want to learn more. Um, and then they start asking questions. And good science starts with good questions. I think it's really interesting to actually be able to go measure, uh, collect the data, and then come back here in like a matter of 15 minutes and be able to carry out an actual procedure and then be able to read our own tests from the last day. So we put it in this container. We're going to get a count of how much bacteria is going to be in the water. And then they end up like this. Any of the chambers that glow indicate high levels of bacteria? Yeah. Though? So we've been discovering that the Bronx River has a high level of intercoccus bacteria in it, and which basically means that it's very polluted. Um, and what we're also trying to support through our statistical analysis is that Bronxville is actually contributing to this pollution, and our research could actually help change that. That could actually help make a difference, which as high school students, we don't really ever have an opportunity to actually help and apply our knowledge in ways that can actually be beneficial to our community that we live in. The program started off with this independent study in class in the high school, but now it's a whole K through 12 um, curriculum. The curriculum includes the history of the river, the ecology of the river, some of the current issues facing the river. There's not a lot left of nature. What we have is in our backyards and, and in small parks like what's bordering the Bronx River. And so I think people realize this is it for wildlife and like we need to defend it and protect it and restore it so that the species that are there can thrive and that we can promote the return of other species. So I think when you bring back a natural resource, it's not just about the river itself. In the same way that you can't restore a river by just looking at the river corridor narrowly, you have to think of the whole watershed. I really do think when you restore a river and that very process can have spillover effects into the community. The Bronx River was once a meandering, clean river teeming with wildlife. The valley where the Native Americans lived was home to beavers, bears, otters, deer, weasels, and wolves, and its fresh waters were filled with snapping turtles and fish. We can never go back in time. However, with the continued efforts of caring people, this small river can be further improved to be enjoyed by all. The Bronx River is truly a river for everyone, even a few beavers have recently returned.